Lane Clinic, who work very closely with joint urology. Um, we've had two talks so far. Earlier in the year, we talked about female incontinence along the overactive bladder, which affects about 50% of women. And then we had to talk about BPH, erectile dysfunction, which affects about 50% of men. Today we're going to talk about kidney stones. I don't I hope none of you here have had one. It affects about 10% of the patient population. Um, and as you'll see during today's talk, they uh, come in all different shapes and sizes. They present in all different ways, and we have a lot of different ways to treat them. Um, so we'll start. So there, there's a lot of cartoons about kidney stones out there. And this guy here on the left is typically what they look like in the emergency department. It's called unelected pain in your back. Who's had a kidney stone here? Anybody raise your hand? Um, the, thing, the thing that you need to know about kidney stone pain is oftentimes people can get a mixed up with back pain, which is very common. Okay? It's the most common diagnosis basically in medicine. Back pain is often positional, so patients can find a way to get comfortable. When you have a kidney stone, you can't find a way to get comfortable. So that, and that's one of the big differences between the two. Um, and, and this guy on the right here, uh, just a little joke about, you know, they pass these stones all the time, apparently. <laughs> so these stones come in all different shapes and sizes. And I just bring this up because we're going to talk about intervention at a later date. But the kidney is about the size of your fist. And your ureter is about the size of a straw. So you can imagine what can pass down a straw. A couple grains of sand can pass down a straw. Maybe an unpopped kernel corn can. But when you get up to things that are about six millimeters, three millimeters, four millimeters, or 10 millimeters, that's like trying to put a marble down a straw or a grape. It won't go, but your body doesn't know any better. It will try to make it go down there until it gets stuck and forces you to come in the emergency department. And the difference is that if a patient is at risk for having urinary tract infections or other infections, when the kidney becomes obstructed, where does the urine go? It becomes stagnant, and then the infection basically starts in the kidney and getting to your bloodstream. So this can be very serious issues in certain patient populations. I didn't bring any stones in today. I don't, you know, we don't we send them right through the lab, so they're basically as hard as the stones that are outside. Uh, we'll talk about first uh, conditions that can cause kidney stones, the types of stones, uh, some of the lab tests that we obtain, how I can ask you to prevent them, only the patient can prevent kidney stones. And the majority of what I do um, as a surgeon is treat most of these kidney stones. Um, this picture sort of talks about where the stones can be located. This is taking a curve in the kidney, and then this tube here is the ureter, which travels all the way down to your bladder. This is a gentleman, obviously, with a kidney stone pain. And these are some of the areas where you'll notice the pain. And to be honest, if you looked at a slide for chronic low back pain, these would be the exact same distribution of pain. The ureter, which starts in the level of the kidney and tapers down into the bladder, like I mentioned, has a small caliber about the size of a straw. When it inserts into the bladder, that's the narrowest portion. That's because the bladder is a muscle. And when we go to the bathroom, we don't want the urine to reflux back up into the kidney. So it's a very narrow portion. When the stone travels through the ureter, I'll talk about that later, Patients who've had stones before know where it is in terms of its location. And that's important in terms of what we're going to do as surgeons in, in terms of intervention. Uh, another picture just depicts where the kidneys are in relationship to your body, your bladder, and up underneath your rib cage. These are some of the major blood vessels that work for the uh, filtration portion of your kidney. <laughs> so they can be formed in the, in the kidney, which are called kidney stones, which are up here. They can be formed in the ureter, okay, excuse me, they can form, form in the kidney, then they'll travel down the ureter, or they can then travel into the bladder. Or you can actually have stones that form in the bladder. For those gentlemen out here who have a large prostate, you don't empty the bladder very well, that urine is stagnant, and any particles that are traveling down will have a tendency to form big stones there. They are composed, obviously, of the metabolic byproducts of your kidney. So your kidney constantly is filtering your blood about one, full, one fifth of your cardiac output goes to your kidney every minute. And your kidneys filter that out for some of the metabolism of the byproducts. And then certain components, mainly calcium and oxalate, can then form stones. Um, why do they form stones? Well, that's because the kidney, in some instances, has a problem filtering the substances, or some patients just have too much of the aforementioned. And when that happens, a stone is going to form. 
just one of those bunch of examples here. Patients will often say, I think I passed the kidney stone, I'm not sure. You can tell that why we give patients strainers. I mean, these are very tiny, oftentimes they'll travel um, after someone goes to the bathroom and they don't strain, so we're not sure. Um, so we talked about the conditions, basically high concentrations. There are some medical conditions that can cause high concentration in the kidney. Changes in the urinary pH, does anybody here have gout? Wow. So patients who have gout, uh, basically their ur urine can become too acidic. So when that happens, certain <coughs> compounds, instead of being in a soluble form, will form a stone form. Uh, urinary stagnation, which is basically a term for obstruction in the urinary tract, the most common being a large prostate, where men don't empty the prostate. You can also have congenital obstructions within the kidney where the urine doesn't drain out well. These patients often present at a younger age um, because the stones form a lot sooner. And that's sort of a different type of patient population than what we're going to talk about today. And we talk about deficiency of stone forming inhibitors. So there's things that make stones, and then there's things that we can introduce to our body to help prevent stones from forming. And we'll talk about a couple of those as well. So a couple of the conditions that can form the kidney stones. The first one, I keep harping the how high concentration of black blood. The other one, and, and basically the most common, in my opinion, is low urinary volume. And for a lot of patients, that's because of reduced fluid intake. Um, and the second reason would be a lot of losses. So we see a lot of athletes in the summertime will start to present with kidney stones with dehydration. A lot of patients, and we'll, we'll go over this urinary volume, and I'll keep talking about it, but a lot of people, as they get older, they have problems with their bladder. Overactive, they have urgency and frequency, they don't have the confidence. So the old school train of thought is, well, if it's bothering me, I'm not going to fill my bladder up and it'll go away. It's, it's counterintuitive to what you want to be doing. If you have an injury, you want to work that muscle and recuperate with physical therapy, you want to be doing the same thing with your bladder. Especially patients with kidney stones. You really want to constantly make them want to dilute urine to prevent any of these substances from forming stones. Uh, additional conditions, it's hard to see here, but changes in the back, and changes in your urinary pH, which I spoke about, are very common in patients who have recurrent urinary tract infections. Okay, what it does is it basically affects how certain compounds are produced in your urine and how they exist in the urine. Patients who have recurrent infections will also commonly have bladder stones, like we'll speak, like we'll speak about later. And we talked about this earlier, the inability for the urine to drain out completely from an enlarged prostate. Um, this is a picture here. This is the normal kidney, which looks nice and round with the kidney beam and the ureter traveling down into the bladder. Here, we're going to talk about a large prostate, which basically causes the muscle fibers to become very thickened in order to overcome that resistance. Like I spoke about earlier, the narrowest portion of the ureter is where it goes into the bladder. So we have a big muscle there. It's causing even more difficulty for the urine to drain down. And eventually what happens is the kidney will back up and sometimes we'll see patients will have some big stones up here in the kidneys. Um, so stone forming inhibitors, these are a little bit more uh, directed for a residency talk here, but citrate, pyrophosphate, and some of proteins are found in our urinary tract. It's typical for some patients to increase the majority of these. Oftentimes it's the, basically the ratio of um, producers versus inhibitors in your body. Citrate we'll talk about is something that we can regulate, and in some patients, calcium phosphate and calcium oxate we can also help to regulate. Um, this is a medical condition, I don't know if anybody here has it, but it's a condition it's called type 1 renal tubular acidosis, and in these patients, their kidneys aren't able to acidify the urine. So what happens is these patients with uniform stones throughout their lives, they usually see me when they're about 25 or 30, if they're not cut early, they're often in renal failure or have to go on dialysis, but it's a very complicated patient population because we don't have the right sort of tools to fix it because it's a genetic problem. The stones, calcium salt stones are the most common. And we'll look at some x-rays today. They have the same color and shape and consistency as your spine and your hips, so we know that they're very hard. Those are essentially the same components that make up your bones. Uric acid stones are some of those stones I spoke to you about earlier, patients who have gout. Also, a lot of patients who have cancer. During cancer treatments, a lot of patients undergo chemotherapy, and those treatments intentionally will target cells that are basically turning over rapidly. And the cells are composed of DNA, and the DNA components are basically acids as well. So patients who are going through chemotherapy, we often talk about hydration, 
They were at risk for also forming stones as well. <coughs> Infectious stones are called magnesium ammonium phosphate. Cysteine stones, we won't talk about that as a hereditary condition that we usually deal with in pediatric population, pediatric population and some other rare stones which we don't talk about today. So this picture here is called the KUD. Okay, this is your spine, and these other hips here. You can see this arrow, it's obviously what we're pointing here. This is a huge stone occupying the whole entire left renal fossa of this patient. The same consistency as the bone, so it's very dense and hard. 80% of the stones that we see are um, composed of calcium, so they're very easy to observe on a plain x-ray study, which is a very good test because it's, it's cheap. It has very low radiation exposure, and it allows us to follow patients with kidney stones sequentially. The type of the calcium salt stone, again, depends upon the pH and the kind of oxalate that we're dealing with in each individual patient. As you can see here, the general appearance is white, hard, and radio opaque. Um, some of the other stones, this is a, called a stagnant stone, and I'll show you a better picture of that later. It's a large stone that forms up in the kidney, and it's basically too large to ever cause a lot of pain it's almost like trying to put a golf ball on a straw. There's no chance that it's ever going to get stuck. It's just going to continue to form and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And some, at some point, it may become infected, or at some point, it'll start to affect how the kidney functions and cause the kidney to get bigger. The smaller stones, which I deal with primarily, and patients here probably have had, will form in the kidney and then travel down the river using the calcium oxygen. <laughs> this is a complicated slide, but I just want to bring to the point that what you take in in your diet and calcium doesn't necessarily always reflect what's going to be in your bloodstream. It's a very complicated process whereby your intestine not only absorbs calcium but it also secretes calcium in terms of loss in your feces. A certain amount of the calcium is obviously going to go towards your bone pool, so strengthening your bones, preventing osteoporosis, and a certain amount is going to go into your kidneys. The one thing to remember is that the train of thought has changed rapidly over the past five years. They would tell people Almost every patient population will stop taking their calcium supplements. Today, at this time, we don't make any recommendations of that unless someone has hyperparathyroidism. The morbidity from someone having osteoporosis and having a hip fracture is significantly greater than someone developing a kidney stone and being treated for that. So, you should all be on calcium and vitamin D because the benefits far outweigh the risks. The only person who should tell you to stop taking calcium should be a nephrologist or a urologist after you've undergone a rather extensive evaluation. Otherwise, there really is no indication to stop any calcium, okay? Specifically, where we live in the Northeast, we have a low amount of sun exposure, we have a higher rate of factors here. These are some pictures. Um, I don't have, these aren't mine exactly, but I've taken out plenty of stones that look like this. You can see that in some patients, there can be literally hundreds, we call it too numerous to count stones in their bladder. Um, other patients, you can tell that this stone over here is probably not going to be comfortable. But I will say this is, um, this is it's three centimeters. Um, you know, the old adage that women are tougher than men is true. I've seen women pass 12 millimeter stones. That's like the size of a great, I don't know how they do it. They come in and they say it's close to labor. Labor is a painful thing. Um, under the microscope, the stones all have this sort of unique appearance. These are the calcium oxalate stones. They're basically a hexagonal pattern. Which the, when you have a stone analyzed, that's how they determine what it is. So calcium salt stone salts, or calcium salt stones. The treatment would be primarily to deal with any infections. Hypercalcemia, which I mentioned, which is basically an excess amount of calcium in the bloodstream. There's a lot of potential causes, and that's why it's important to see a urologist or nephrologist. In some cases, it could be serious. Some patients who have some malignancies can be having a problem with their calcium secretion. Other patients may have a hyperparathyroid problem. In some patients, they may have elevated hyperoxaluria. This is more common nowadays because patients are undergoing a significant amount of gastric bypass surgery. When you take away someone's portion of their intestine that affects how patients absorb a lot of their fats, their calcium, and other minerals, so these patients also need to be evaluated. We'll talk about the diets, increasing the fluid intake, and how we can acidify our urine. Those last three components, if, if you look at the main prevention of stones, number one is going to be increased fluid intake. I'll talk about that. 
Number two is going to be modifying the diet for oxalate products. Number three is going to be making your urine uh, more uh, alkaline with substances. The reason I bring this up is because 80% of stones can be managed or prevented in most patients just by these three simple measures. So this is the diet. You know, there, we have some handouts up here. Please feel free after to obtain them. But high oxalate components of the urine are really prone to forming more stones. A lot of patients nowadays are on a whole host of these different diets, paleolithic diets, no carbohydrates, no gluten, no soy. So what are people eating? They're eating protein and they're eating a lot of vegetables. <coughs> That's great, but if you're taking in too much of the aforementioned, you're going to be at risk of forming some stones. So some patients live on, on soy and tofu products. Other patients have uh, spinach like every all three meals of their day. Um, this is, there's a handout box about what components each of these have, not just the volume of the serving size, but how much oxygen. Certain teas are not beneficial for you. Um, but those are some handouts there. So you can see there's a lot of different changes that you have to make in terms of your diet. So the second point on that slide, two slides ago, was about how much urine is enough. So if you can, if you're not on any medications that change the color of your urine, you're not on multivitamins, a poor man's test to see if you're hydrated is to pee in a cup and see if you can see through it and not have any discoloration. That, by definition, is mean, means you're hydrated. When you look at recommendations for urologists for preventing stones, it's three liters of urine a day. So in order to make three, you need to take in four. That's a lot. So I got, this is one liter of food. So you have to drink four of these a day. I don't know I, I don't either, but I don't know if anybody else would be admit that they're able to drink that much per day, but it has to really become a lifestyle change. And you lose one liter of urine by sweating, breathing, when you move your bowels. So you really have to, you know, make a conscious effort to do this. I don't know if some of you are my patients or not, but some tricks would be Every time you fill your car up at the gas station, there's always a thing of water there. Just keep that in your car, so you're always having a bottle there. Rather than filling up big jugs in your fridge, which you're, you're not going to keep going back, you just have multiple small bottles throughout the day and try to get through them. Um, but it really is very difficult to do. I mean, we perform all these metabolic tests every day in the office, and out of every 10 patients that come in, maybe one. And these patients have had stones forever, and they're dying from them. They just can't do it, but maybe one out of ten will actually make enough urine to prevent them. Uric acid stones, nobody has gotten here surprisingly, but that's the accumulation of uric acid, which often shows up in the big toe. It's about 8 to 10 percent of stones are often associated with gout. Um, the acidic urine that forms them, they're very small. They can also form in that big stone that I showed you about. The difference with uric acid stones is because they're a very lightly composed stone, they don't show up on a lot of x-rays. So if you know anybody that has uric acid stones, getting x-rays is not going to be the way to follow them. Those patients, unfortunately, need to have CAT scans um, to see if the stones come back. Or an ultrasound. <laughs> the other stones we spoke about are these chronic UTI stones called magnesium ammonia phosphate. They're about 10% of stones. Um, and these are patients who have recurrent urinary tract infections. Specifically, an organism called Proteus has been known to form these stones. Um, Often these patients are really sick when they have this pain. These are some pictures of the uric acid stones. You can tell in the microscope that these stones look a little bit different than the calcium oxalate stones. They also tend to be nice and round, so patients have an easier time passing these guys than the other ones, which more look like jacks. So here's an example of a kidney that's been bivalve, and this huge structure here is a big kidney stone. Yes. You can tell that this kidney this kidney has not been functioning well. And the reason that this kidney is, is, is like this is because they have it has a very small area of parenchyma here. So it was probably a non-functional kidney that was causing recurrent infections. And if the kidney doesn't contribute greater than 10% of the overall kidney function, we just take the kidney out. So that's why the specimen's all intact right here. There's another example here, another poorly function. Um, this actually, uh, this is actually a pathologist, pathology specimen um, post mortem, I believe. Um, but you can tell this area here is basically the whole flecking system of the kidney, all obstructing with the stone here. 
<laughs> Cysteine stones, I'll just briefly talk about them. Um, they're a rare type of kidney stone. Um, it's usually due to a genetic inheritance called almost like a cystinuria. Chlorine and acidic urine, obviously you change the pH. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and they're difficult to identify on, on stones. And we treat these not only with dietary changes, but also with some medications that prevent the stones from forming. So what these look like, much different appearance than any of the stones that we see. So laboratory investigations, this guy is here, the key stone came back and it didn't pass. Um, very rarely, it's, it's interesting because these patients, like I said, have their lives dictated by these stones and no matter how many tests I order or how many recommendations you make, only like 10% of people achieve what we want in, in, from the test results that will help prevent these stones from forming. Um, if the stones formed and removed, we can have it analyzed. Usually what happens is they look at it on the microscope and they can see those different sorts of crystals. So there's what we call low-risk forming, forming patients and high-risk forming patients. A patient who's in their 50s with no significant risk factors who had one episode of passing a small stone probably doesn't need a full metabolic evaluation or workup. Those that do include recurrent stone formers. Any child, obviously, that has a kidney stone needs to have a full evaluation workup. The cysteine stone formers, those are going to be known oftentimes ahead of time because of a family history. Uh, patients who form calcium phosphate stones, which are associated with infection. And now, like I mentioned here, we see a lot more patients presenting with GI disease and surgery from gastric bypass surgery. Patients living a lot longer after having colon resections. Uh, Crohn's disease and also colitis, sort of like a mini epidemic occurring with what we call a lot of gluten allergies and other um, diet related inflammatory diseases. Um, so, bone demineralization causes hypercalcemia, uh, which is basically an elevated calcium in your blood, is blood and urine. So, patients who have bone loss, this can occur. Um, additionally, patients who have some other medical conditions and inflammatory conditions like sarcoidosis. And primary hyperparathyroidism is a test set. Very easy to obtain. It's just a serum calcium level and oftentimes a scan that's performed by um, radiology. Um, the bottom one here, you can't read it well, but certain patients who take Topamax, so there is a patient population of chronic migraine headaches. Topamax basically becomes insoluble in the urinary tract and can form stones. Um, vitamin D and calcium supplements, again, I don't subscribe to this in terms of discontinuation of either of those. And high doses of vitamin C is in a very rare patient population. Uh, patients who have HIV, also um, a certain group of their protease inhibitor medications, which are very common in the regimens, can form kidney stones as well. So the regular investigation or evaluation that we perform would include a serum level of your calcium and your uric acid, and then we would look at the urine in terms of the volume, and what component of the urine has uh, calcium oxalates and cysteine levels. Has anybody here done that 24 hour urine test? So it's a long day. You, you can't go far. Everything's got to go in the jug for your at home. Um, from the studies, we can decide what are potentially going to be the causes. The pH can be adjusted. We can look at the pH and determine its infectious cause. And then also, you know, urinary tract imaging, everybody gets um, a CAT scan nowadays um, when they go to the emergency department. Uh, so probably maybe 10% of the patients I see have gone in for uh, whether they think they have a gallbladder problem or a colon problem and they find incidental stones which correlates to the incidence in the patient population of about 10%. So, how do we, this is the better part, how do we prevent stones? No salt, no beer, no soda. Okay, these are two of the biggest contributors to stones. Salt seems counterintuitive because the more salt you intake, the more you drink. However, when salt is filtered in the kidney, the kidney is a very smart or, uh, organ. For every salt molecule that goes into the into your urine, a calcium molecule has to accompany it. And that's the way that the system works in the kidney. So the more salt you take, you may think you're going to be drinking enough, but you're also going to be putting more calcium into the urinary tract as well. 
alcohol, it's a diuretic. It's the bottom line. And soda has a lot of phosphorus in it. So phosphorus, which makes soda taste good, turns it brown, uh, likes to exist in a state of calcium phosphate. So those two minerals like to stay together. If there's a lot of phosphate around, you're going to have to find some calcium, often stripped from the bones or taken from your GI secretions, and that'll increase the amount of calcium phosphorus in your body. Prevention uh, is acidification of the urine, or excuse me, alkaliz alkalization of the urine. Let me just correct that. Even though citric acid is an acid, and your body acts as a base, so it rises the pH up to the urine, which prevents cells from forming. And then I put it in here twice, but water, water, water is, you can't stress it enough. This is a, if you go online, it would be about a thousand Google hits for diets to prevent uh, kidney stones. This is a, I went through a bunch of them recently, and I sort of found this is a very generic, but easy one to follow. Um, if you're going to have tea, green tea is probably the one that we recommend the most. It has low concentration of oxalate. Um, also, the byproducts of green tea for gentlemen in this room um, has an associated with decreased risk of prostate cancer. Uh, lemon lime water is another simple way to increase uh, your, your the citrate in your diet. Uh, low fat yogurt or milk diets. Bananas are another good source. A lot of fruits and vegetables are good. These in moderation are also helpful. Um, it's obvious to avoid a lot of excess calcium, but again, not supplements. Um, any salty food, you know, I tell patients if it comes in a can or it's delivered over a deli uh, window, don't take it. It's going to be loaded with salt. We're just going to burn stones. Um, grapefruit juice in excess quantity. And then these are those products that are high in oxalate down here. And there's, I think we have a handout up here that will deliver all these products here. There's black tea. That's, that's a killer right there. Patients have a couple of cups of tea and that. And that's it, and giving us up high oxygen and hydrating yourself. <laughs> Medications, um, if you haven't had a stone, these will be unfamiliar to you, but uh, as urologists and nephrologists, we oftentimes use a couple of different medications to help prevent stones from forming or treating patients who have stones. One of the most common medications, some of you may recognize this is a diuretic, hydrochlorothiazide or clothaldone. It's different than your Lasix medication, which a lot of patients take, okay? Lasix classically causes an increased amount of calcium in the urinary tract, which then increases your risk for stones. These diuretics called thi thiazides actually trick the kidney into thinking that there's a lot of calcium in it, so it prevents the resorption, which I mentioned earlier, and then that urine travels back into your bloodstream and those are lost through your feces. Potassium citrate, we talked about making your urine more basic with medication or with uh, citrate products. This is the shortcut to it, okay? Um, the potassium in here is not a small quantity, so patients need to be monitored for their serum potassium levels. If patients have any cardiac conditions or arrhythmias, um, your potassium is very important to regulate because that can cause problems with your conduction system. So anybody who has a cardiac condition, we're very worried about this. Um, I haven't tried this. I haven't tried a lot of medication in urology. I'm still young, but the it's very tart. It's like taking a whole box of tart, sweet tarts in a movie, putting it in one capsule, and drinking the media. So the compliance is a little bit low. Um, so allopurinol, if anyone has gout, that actually helps to prevent the amount of um, lowers, the, increases the pH of your urine as well. And with the set, if I all these are two medications I won't really talk about, but some patients who have those really big kidney stones. Uh, and they're too big to, um, to undergo surgery. We can instill medications in them. And sometimes that can um, actually dissolve the stones. It's usually done in, obviously in the hospital setting. So if you have passed a kidney stone, I hope that you were prescribed a couple of these medications that I'm going to list here. These will all help the stones pass. Um, the first is basically non steroidal anti inflammatories, which would be your ibuprofen or your Advil. Um, when you think about those medications, there's two different dosages. The, the over-the-counter dose, which is about 200 milligrams, is usually for a pain reliever, but if you're really looking for anti-inflammation, which helps to reduce any swelling, it should be about 600 milligrams three times a day. Flomax, if any of you gentlemen in the, office take, or in the audience take that, 
That helps to dilate the prostate, but we also know that it dilates the distal portion of the ureter. So as that stone is trying to get pushed down, it's basically opening up the distal portion of the bladder. Um, analgesics, which basically are you know Percocet or Vicodin, that allows you to increase your fluid intake to try to push the stone out. Um, Anti-nausea medications, such as Compazine, and then almost all the patients to be on the safe side. We, I don't prescribe antibiotics to everybody and over prescribe, but for patients trying to pass a stone, specifically females or any men with a large prostate who may have bacteria in the urine, we always put them on antibiotics. If any urine gets behind the stone, like I said, it can cause a really bad infection. All right, so this is when I get caught about two in the morning. There's a stone stuck here. There's no scent in place, and this patient's having a lot of discomfort. <coughs> Oftentimes we'll place stents, I'm going to pass it around here. This is stale, it's actually so. so this is a little polypropylene, polypropylene tube, which has a hole in the middle. You can see it actually has holes on the side there. Um, we're able to put these up, and it basically will bypass any stone, whether it's here, here, or here in the ureter. Um, the stent does a couple of things. First off, because um, if there's any obstructed urine, it's going to allow the urine to pass through the stent, and it also allows the urine to pass alongside of the stent. The other thing that's really important for us is that this tube is very narrow. So when we put up any of our ureteroscopes or cameras, we don't want to cause any trauma. A stent being in place allows that tube to dilate up, so when we go to do the procedure, it makes it a lot easier. And more importantly, it's less risk to the patients for having any trauma. If for some reason, patient's ureter is unable to be scented, meaning that from below, the stone is impacted. These patients, unfortunately, and I say that unfortunately because you can imagine walking around with this bag hanging out of your side, one that go to frostomy tube, where we actually access through the skin, directly through the kidney, and then you can see here where the tube is going to allow the ureter to drain outside through the body through the external catheter bag. The other option here, obviously much better, you are straight down into the bladder, and the stent's not externalized. Once the, once the stent's in place, the patient's unobstructed and obtains control, then we can talk about how we're going to treat the kidney stone. Very rarely, if ever, would you want to treat a kidney stone in patients who, has, who could potentially have an active infection because of the risk of causing sepsis or damaging the urine. The ESWL procedure is called extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. It's basically a mechanism by which energy is delivered through the skin and targeted at the stone. It's almost like a video game when we do these procedures. Um, if you've had it before, we used to have to put patients in a bathtub. It's obviously a big deal. Filthy wet, it's a mess. Um, and then that, because the water was the medium that the energy traveled through. Now, uh, with advances, we basically have a machine that's about the size of my this hand goes up against the side, and then the stone's targeted under ultrasound or x-ray, and it's broken up. It has about a 50 to 85 percent efficacy rate, depending upon the stone size and how dense it is. And also, we want to look at the location of the stone, too. Stones that are out here in the kidney are very close to the skin. So we use something called the skin-to-stone ratio or distance. If the distance from the skin to the stone is less than 10 centimeters, the efficacy is up consistently. When stones travel down the ureter, you can see that the distance is much greater, so we usually don't use this treatment for stones that are in the ureter. Um, patients often, I recommend them going to sleep for the procedure. It's like getting flicked in the skin about 2,500 times. So they move around a little bit, and when there's any movement, you can picture trying to target the stone the size of a marble. And if it's moving a little bit, then you're not going to have a good efficacy rate. Ureteroscopes, probably what I do the most of. Um, these are very tiny cameras. You can tell this is a marker, and you can tell this is a, the camera that we have to use that goes up this tube. Um, it travels up through the bladder into the tube, and then you can target the stone. Uh, usually, once we have the stone identified, we use lasers that fragment it up into smaller pieces and those fragments we come back on. PCNL, I hope nobody here has had to have one of these. Um, these are for these big stones. So this, this is a kidney stone here. This is another one here. You can tell this patient's 
we see these every, you know, two or three times a year patients will present like this. So you're never going to be able to go up from below to get rid of the stone, and you can shock this stone as well forever. It's just going to stay here. So we usually put the patients to sleep, and then we, we put in a trocar, which is about the size of a, a Sharpie pen, and through that, here we are, this is the here we are basically extracting the stone fragments out individually from the kidney. It has a lot of morbidity if the patient's going to stay overnight. There's a lot of potential complications. But when the stones are that large, there's no other way. There's a couple other ways I'll show you, but this is the best way to, to remove the stones. In some patients, um, where I trained at Leahy, where we, we, we do get some really complicated cases, we've had four of these as a patient, four children are trying to grab a stone like this. We get, she, she had one kidney. Uh, the other option is open surgery. So this is a kidney stone again. Wow. Um, and here you are with a flank with a big flank incision, which can be painful. And we basically make an incision in the kidney. Um, and, and here we are, just example, just pull, trying to pull the stone out. The kidney is very vascularized, so the surgery has a lot of morbidity. When you sew the kidney back up again. Um, it, the area that you had to incise loses its function, so we've got to be very careful if we ever pursue one of these. The, the other time I've had to do this, just this past year actually, um, was um, we put a, um, a stent up a patient who had one of these stones, and um, the infection was so severe that she basically formed gangrene of the kidney, and we had to take it out. So there can be some certain, this patient was very young, only four. Um, and I just mentioned that because you know, everybody's on antibiotics nowadays, and it's, it's, it's great to some extent, but it's creating a big resistance pattern. So people who are younger and have really good immune systems, when they get affected by certain strains of E. coli, they don't end up in the, in the uh, ER, they end up in the ICU because the response is so great that their body can't, can't take it. It's their lungs and their, and their heart that are trying to function with these big immune responses. When you had a patient in Nashua, um, She's 25 years old, she came with a kidney stone, and uh, she was admitted upstairs. Nobody, they said, I'll oh, just put her on the regular floor. Before she eight hours later, they came back and she'd already passed away. <laughs> so when all else fails, there are a lot of ways to do I don't know about all these. Um, the only one I would say is probably the lemon juice and the water, but patients um, have come in claiming that if they mix up some olive oil with some lemon juice, um, they can help pass the stones, apple cider, a Russian patient of mine who swears hot water it came in, he had like burns on him, he didn't understand, he was swore by it, uh, and he passed the stone. Um, so there's a lot of different potential options for that. <laughs> Questions? Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Good. How does one differentiate between a gallstone and a kidney stone, and where would the pain be? as opposed to a kidney stone with a gallstone? Good question. So, there, we, you know, gallstones and kidney stones are the two stones that we form. Um, there is no correlation between the two, just, just so you know. So a gallstone would be more, in, under the rib cage, more anterior or in terms of its pain. However, plenty of patients with gallstones who have been told they have gallstones have gone to the ER, only to get a CAT scan and find that it was a kidney stone. So it's hard based on symptoms. Some simple things are gallstones tend to cause problems after somebody eats a fatty meal. That's when the gallbladder starts to contract actively to break down a lot of fat products. So patients have what's called postprandial or after eating pain. That would be one way to, to help. But the true test is going to be either a CT scan or an ultrasound to differentiate the two. Um, but patients, again, I come in with, I, they, I, they've seen me, I said, oh, it sounds like a kidney stone, I've got an ultrasound, and it's a gallstone. Um, but it usually is based on imaging studies to differentiate the two things. And those are obviously treated much differently um, as well. Yes? In taking milk and calcium fortified juice, is it a better way to take calcium as to take in supplements, or can the damage forming kidney stones be the same? It's a, it's a good question. I think if you look at the recommendations of what you want to take, it sort of depends upon how you want to take your calcium. There is no difference between the two. So either way. Either way, yeah. Um, you know, we, it depends about also, you know, a lot of products that have a lot of sugars and things like that. You're looking at calcium intake. But 
it really wouldn't make a difference between the two. Which, which one, okay. But I can't stress enough. Don't stop your calcium. Nobody. That, that's calcium supplements are very important. You don't want to discontinue any of those. How often are you here if you go to I'm here um, half of the month, about sometimes. Yeah. You can make arrangements to see patients anytime. Yes? I thought that uh, form that you showed where certain foods were good and certain foods to avoid. Do you have a leaflet? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Do you, you have, have those for handouts? Yeah, we have a bunch of handouts about. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yes. okay. But again, if you don't have kidney stones, you don't need to make significant adjustments in, in your diet. These are mainly for patients who do have stones, they have them for years. Um, they're often diehard dieters or their food products are really consistent and we ask them to just adjust them. Thank you. Uh, how often is one of your groups in the York office? There should be somebody there at least four days a week. Very should be somebody there at least three to four days per week. Might not be myself, but it'll be one of my other partners. Doctor, for those who've had stones in the past, is there any thought to you know periodic X-rays or scans to detect them before they move from the kidney into the problem areas? Most definitely. Anytime I uh, see a patient for the first time, it's usually because. If they're in the emergency department or whatnot, they're going to have a stone and I'll treat their stones. Um, they all should then, after any intervention you have, you should then be followed up in three months with an ultrasound and x-ray just to make sure there was no damage to the kidney. And then every year, it's my practice, and it's, that's the guidelines by the AUA, uh, we obtain um, an x-ray and an ultrasound. So an x-ray will show the stones that are radiolucent of the calcium phosphate, the dense ones. But the ultrasound will also look to see if there's any stones that don't show up in x ray. <clears throat> the other thing to remember is even though you have a kidney stone, it doesn't need to be treated because a lot of stones may remain up in the kidney and never cause any problems. Also, patients who have a lot of medical comorbidities, the risk of anesthesia can be great. If it's a really big stone, trying to go through the kidney to access it could be a problem. As long as it's not bothering somebody, you don't necessarily need to treat it. Um, that's a patient by patient um, decision. But every year, every kidney stone patient should have an x ray, an ultrasound, and I tend to try to do the 24 hour urine test every year too, just to sort of get patients a, you know, where they stand in terms of whether or not they're keeping up to their, uh, you know, their commitments. Most of them have a hard time, but that's pretty standard for sure. How many other hospitals do you cover? I cover three other hospitals. Yeah. So we work in Portsmouth and some other places in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. After you pass the kidney stone, is it normal to see a uh, definite darkness to your urine, which would indicate some blood in it or mm -hmm. not? Is that unusual? No, let's go over that. That's a good point. So passing a kidney stone, for those of you who have, is uh, a difficult process and I just want to mention so so the ureter which is right here and here's the kidney going down so the ureter has two areas of innervation so anything on the proximal ureter which we consider above here above the pelvic <laughs> rim which is about mid flank Oh, if a stone is stuck on its way down here, the ureter is going to dilate, and when it dilates, you're going to get some swelling around the kidney, and that's going to be, it's going to present like this guy here with back pain. As the stone travels down, if you're on, you don't have to be, but if you're on any anticoagulants, expect to see some blood. Don't expect to see red blood, expect to see brown blood, okay? It's going to be some stagnant blood that the, the enzymes in your kidney are going to break down and make a Coca Cola color. Afterwards, once the kidney stone travels past the halfway point and makes its way down towards the bladder, the distribution changes significantly because this portion of the ureter, anatomically and embryologically, has a different innervation pattern. And interestingly enough, you don't present with side pain down here or hip pain. You present with lower abdominal pain, urgency, frequency, 
Men can have testicular pain and leg pain. And that's how a lot of patients can tell me where the stone is as they're passing it. This part here, the distal portion of the ureter going into the bladder, is the most difficult portion. Patients will oftentimes go to the bathroom 25 times a day, nothing will come out. And that's because the bladder is not happy with you know, a big piece of granite trying to travel through it. So it's contracting, and it's either going to push the stone back up into the kidney, or the ureter, or down into the bladder. So that's why when we talk about passing them, we try to increase the fluid intake. We use medications to dilate this portion of the ureter, and we use pain medication to get the stone to pass. But that, that's a good question. The discoloration of the urine um, will definitely be an indicator you know, how, of the stone pass. And when it's brown like that, that you just hold blood that's traveling through. If you have them once, does that mean you'll get them again? So 50 percent of patients who have a kidney stone will have it recur. And that's, um, in my opinion, um, young urologist, I think that's just non-compliance because one of my colleagues, Jessica Vanderbilt, who's world around, she trained in Indiana, and that's all they do in Indiana is meet, eat meat, and they have awful diets, and they have the biggest waste circumferences in the country. <laughs> and, and they have the highest stone population. And these patients come in with their kidneys littered with stones, like almost the ones I showed you. And, and they have this program where it's, it's they constantly call the patients like every month. They make them keep a diet log. They are like almost hostile in terms of you know calling these patients. Like when people call you for the politics, but they're constantly calling these patients. And she says about 85 percent of the patients don't have stones. You know it, it's amazing, but it, it really is. It's a lifestyle change to try to prevent these things from occurring. Um, but when she told me that, you know that was very interesting considering the amount of patients she sees out there. You, about another good point. So if you did 100, 100 CT scans today, about 10% of patients would have a cyst in their kidney. The majority, about 95% of cysts, are not associated with kidney stones at all. They're basically physiological collections of fluid, similar to ovarian cysts or the cysts. And depending upon the size or what it looks like, we would, we would monitor it with, again, serial imaging studies. But no association with, with kidney stones. But they are very common. Um, so, if a cyst were to change its characteristics um, in terms of uh, the density or how it appears, in those cases, as they change or progress, they do have a risk for malignancy, so we would remove them. A cyst can be as small as a quarter, or it can be as big as a basketball. And I've seen patients who've had, <laughs> but they, they, they don't even know because they grow so slow. Um, but some patients, they can become uncomfortable. Our radiologists here, you can aspirate a cyst and pull the fluid out, and then you inject medication into the cyst that causes the cyst walls to collapse. Um, so you don't have to undergo a big, big percentage. Can you tell us about ultrasound? Ultrasound is one way to follow a cyst size, but if you want to see if the cyst is changing how its characteristics are, you need to do a CAT scan. That's a must because the contrast and basically tell whether or not the cyst is changing. If you have several small stones in the kidney, do they attach to each other? Um, there's something called um, heterozygous nucleation, which means stones from different different backgrounds, whether like uric acid and the calcium oxide stones, they certainly can form together. Sometimes when patients have a procedure where we shock the stones, there'll be some small stone fragments left over, and then they may be lost to follow-up when they come back about three years later, all those stones form back again. So they certainly can, can form back again. That's why it's very important after the treatment and um, to have that x-ray study three months later to look to make sure that you know, the fragments are, are gone. Now. But sometimes it's hard to get rid of the fragments. I mean, as when, we, when we go up to the kidneys with these cameras, you can only remove so, so much stuff because we use baskets and graspers, but some things are too small to remove. And anatomically, sometimes it's hard to flush those areas out. So some patients are going to be prone to, no matter what we do, for them again. Yes? If you have a patient uh, who's had several stones and you've got them on medication, say like allopurinol, are there any um, long-term side effects from that therapy, or can you keep them on it forever? 
depending upon the therapy, the answer is no. And that, that's one of the things that folks in Indiana stressed is that once you get a patient on a steady regimen of medication and the laboratory studies have been stable uh, and the imaging studies have remained stone free, you can be on most of these medications for your lifetime. They don't have a, um, you don't develop a tolerance to these medications where you have to increase the dosage. So a lot of medications uh, we can keep patients on if we can get under control um, forever. Any other questions? I didn't see the blue stick on this side. Where is it up there? <laughs> <laughs> so they decide they wanted to try it. <laughs> <laughs> so unlike you know the other talks where we talk about enlarged prostates and overactive bladder, which are routine screening questions for most of the general practitioners and the internists. Kidney stones don't show up that way. So it's, it's not as if you, you don't routinely screen for kidney stones um, with our primary care physicians or our interns. So unfortunately, by the time someone's seen me for this, it's usually a little bit too late um, in terms of their stones. And what's the average uh, percentage of population? About 10% of patients. 10%. Yeah, patients with recurrent kidney infections is definitely a little bit higher, um, but about 10% of patients. Or they'll experience, let's put it this way, they'll experience a kidney stone attack. I'm sure plenty of patients pass away with kidney stones that have never been caused problems. Mm -hmm. What age can you not get kidney stones? Never. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think you can. Uh, no kidney. If you have dialysis, you won't get kidney stones. They will, they will occur. And they're, they're, they're increasing more and more and more. And that's because um, you know, the diet, American diet is so bad. So we're seeing more stones forming. Um, diabetes affects the way that you regulate the ammonium in your diet. Uh, and that also affects the metabolic process in your kidney. And you know, we see diabetic kids now, 12 years old, which, which is crazy. 100 years ago, there wasn't diabetes. but. Young kids are coming into the clinic in the late teens with obesity, metabolic syndrome, and kidney stones. And it's, these are the stones that are forming in patients in the 30s and 40s, now forming in young kids. So it, it, it's, a big, it's a big problem. It, um, unfortunately, um, it's, not, it's not declining. And we're seeing more and more stone patients. Any age, yeah, for sure. Um, Pediatric patients get them uh, quite often when we do our training. Um, from immobilization, a lot of kids who are chronically in the hospital, um, they need kidney stones. And patients, young patients, they have heart failure, they use a lot of Lasix, which I told you there's two different types of diuretics. we will give them so much Lasix that their kidneys will form calcium stones too. Does geographics play a part in uh, patient care? The number of cases that you see, in other words, with the western part of the United States or the eastern or some other country. So the southeast has the highest rate of kidney stones. Oh, really? Yeah, because they're, you know, the, the, the weather down there. Is that? Because of the weather, oh. it's a higher rate of dehydration. Um, it's interesting because you think the southwest would be constantly dry, but the southeast has the higher rate of kidney stones throughout the country. We don't have a ton of them up here. Interesting. Yeah. I'm just wondering if that has to do with the age of the population in the southeast mostly. No, it's, it definitely has to do with, you know, they correct me for all the patterns. It definitely has to do with what well, I think is the, is the humidity in there and, uh, you know, it's wet. These patients are sweating all the time and not keeping up. And, and, you know, the Midwest region has a high population because of their diet um, as well, right? Dairy and protein rich diet. Um, again, a lot of these diet fads. Or ultra high protein and, and certain vegetables are predisposed to some patients to stones as well. So it's not sweat. Don't sweat. No, just take it easy. Something's in trouble here. Right. Uh, so what is the question? So if there's no other questions, there's some handouts here. Um, if you have any other questions, I'll be sticking around for a while. And, uh, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it.